So I want to talk about um, how we are sort of very gently coming into uh, rethinking of of a material practice in our work. I am Meta, I'm a head of something called Sita, and we look at sort of a, a breadth across a sort of a digital design space. And of course, we're sitting in the middle of an academy, we're Academy of Fine Arts, and as many in our practice, um, the point is that we come from design thinking and that we challenge the sort of um, uh, other kinds of uh, t uh, technological trajectories. Um, so I want to zoom all the way out, and uh, I, I forgive me if it's a bit um, uh, sort of heavy, uh, but I, I, of course, we are sitting inside of a context, and this context we can we we can be in a very refined space, uh, perhaps here, but around us is a, a much. Uh, uh, more social and economic and environmental crisis going on. And, um, and I think the point is really the sheer scale of everything. So uh, as we now know that we will build for 2.3 billion people more over the next 35 years, we really have to reconsider our material practices. And I think this idea of materials running out is a really good context for what we're doing. Um, it simply necessitates us to uh, rethink how we how we will build in the future and with what. Um, I would like to critique this platform. Uh, I think there's a sort of seamless flow from the digital uh, design community into these kinds of questions of Industry 4.0, cyber physical systems. But I think what's at stake here is really that is a continuation of the industrialist uh, paradigm, where the idea is that technology will simply just optimize our processes and we will be able to continue to do the same just better. And I think uh, it, it, we are just at a very different kind of um, position. And we need to um, rethink uh, the paradigms of mass fabrication and standardization. And of course, beneath this lies this sort of language of sustainability, um, again, with a global agenda and now also a global language. Uh, you can be c cynical about this, but I, I think really um, what's important here is that we can now speak to each other across very, very different kinds of knowledge spaces. I, you all know what this is now. Uh, sustainable, yeah, good. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I think uh, perhaps in my particular part of our field, and maybe a lot of what we were doing started with more speculative interests. We're finding a new kind of relevance um, uh, as we uh, challenge uh, industrial thinking and move into a new nature-based material paradigm. And nature is, of course, interesting because it's renewable, but it's also uh, the idea of uh, growth. And in that, we create much more uh, or uh, complex and heterogeneous materials determined by behaviors. And so how do we even fabricate with these kinds of materials? Um, I think that what we've been working with in CETA and across our field over the last uh, 10 years is really prototyping the methods by which we'll be able to work with this. And here, the idea of design simulation, integrating simulation into the design space, uh, allowing us to work with form finding and material interaction across uh, um, material systems. You know, I don't know this computer. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, extending the digital chain to include uh, material fabrication, um, understanding modeling landscapes as being something that is highly networked between specified models that are passing information between them um, and event-based models where we have models that are being generated on the fly. Um, are really the sort of infrastructures, I mean here the methodological infrastructures to be able to operate within a multi-scale design space where we are working across structural investigations, element uh, investigations and material investigations, really allowing us to um, broaden uh, design agency in architecture. Um, so I think also, uh, What's important here is the transfer, the ability to transfer these skills across uh, into um, new kinds of strategies. Of course, digital fabrication allows us to think about heterogeneous materials such as timber, 
um, or uh, bioplasts which uh, undergo fundamental and large uh, changes under fabrication. Um, uh, we have been able to create uh, adaptive models that incorporate incoming data on the fly, integrate live sensing, and employ machine learning methods to be able to deal with the uh, dates, uh, sense data. So just two very brief examples here, Stress Skin and A Bridge Too Far by Paul Nicholas and, and team here from CETA, where we're working with uh, incremental sheet forming, which works across the scales, meaning that you're man uh, manipulating the material at, at a sort of uh, micro scale as well as at macro scale. And these processes of fabrication are highly characterized by spring back. So we get this thing that you're pressing down the material, the material wants to spring back. So how do you actually work with that? And here Paul um, devised uh, some very interesting um, adaptive models in which he was able to, uh, here's a robot that's doing the incremental sheet forming and pressing the material, not a lot of force, just a lot of times, and then because of the spring back, there's a, a, an inaccuracy. So we sense uh, where the location of these connector pieces that need to be precisely connected, where they are. We use that sense data uh, uh, to then be able to adaptively correct the model on the fly. And I think, I mean, I think we're not the only ones who are doing this. It's, it's maturing across the field. But the point is that these methods are absolutely necessary if we want to work with more complex material systems. So yeah, local adjustment and yeah, whatever here. Um, and the other example here uh, in our collaboration with uh, Billy Faircloth and her team from Kieran Timberlake, where we looked, with, looked at uh, state change materials. So here's phase change waxes. Um, where we are putting in sensors into the panels. These are um, uh, vacuum formed uh, uh, plastic panels that are poured uh, with wax um, to then understand uh, micro changes in the thermodynamic um, uh, cooling and heating of the panels that uh, affect the wax and make them go clearer and dark. Again, we use the sense data to actually be able to understand the performance of the panels and thereby to be able to, at a very micro scale, change the geometry of these uh, sort of pockets or waffle kind of uh, shapes. Uh, again, using machine learning to be able to understand the data and parse it into changes into the panel structures so we can uh, direct and change performance. So you can see the performances are um, across a, a sunny day here, and we can change it across the different panels. So I think, um, ah, just one more idea. So uh, uh, I think here in this world, um, 3D print becomes a quite particular tool. Martin gave me this, it's absolutely awful. He controlled this beautifully, but I don't know why I have to have the video where everything fails, but. <laughs> it's very disgusting. This is porcelain extruding. Um, and of course, the wonder of 3D printing, ah, sorry, I didn't look at you. Um, I will conclude, is that uh, we can work with many, many different material systems and that 3D printing really becomes an open tool by which we can work with different kinds of um, uh, uh, systems that have otherwise uh, not been able to be industrialized in fabrication. Fascinating uh, uh, presentation, but is there a danger that we lose sight of the fantastic process that humankind has developed since the 18th century? Because many of the industrial processes in the realm of the bespoke or the individuated have remained underexplored, yet the techniques you show have become the common currency of the research labs of our, our architecture departments and universities. Do you, do you mean a craft space uh, knowledge about, know. or what, I, what, I, what do you mean? The... I mean many of the processes that we think are, as, are part of mainstream industry, even unfashionable heavy industries. And, and uh, you know, I, I think there's a great danger that they're, they're being underexplored because they're seen as part of the 20th century paradigm. The paradigm might have been wrong, but some of the processes are absolutely brilliant. 
Um, I, mm, I don't know if I'm saying that. I, I don't know if I, I have that sort of... Uh, I think the paradigms I want to leave is the a paradigm of um, uh, mass fabrication and standardization. So, of course, not in its entirety. It's not a sort of diagrammatic, now we start something else. But how do we actually enter processes where we think of bespoke materials that are designed for site and use? And well, I mean, uh, SPIF, for instance, is, is hammering, really. I mean, it, um, it's incremental sheet forming, so it's not hammering as points, but it's the same sort of technique. So it's incredibly uh, uh, craft space. I mean, that's how you make silver bowls. And, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a known technique uh, as such. So I don't feel that in the actual um, construction uh, or in the actual technique of fabrication, that there is a sort of like all industrialized techniques must be uh, uh, left behind, and we will now only enter other techniques. It's more, yeah, it's more this idea about um, specification, hyper specification, and being able to individualize um, uh, manufacture, uh, so we can avoid um, uh, waste. Does that answer you? Mm. Okay, good. <laughs> I'll do the rest. Cool. Thank you so much.